Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Gilbert, and along with Anne Birchall, my fellow track co-chair, I'd like to welcome you to the Epidemiology and Public Health Sciences Plenary. Uh, what epidemiology tells us is that if we are to achieve our collective goal of reducing HIV incidence in Canada, that we can't meaningfully do this if we don't see a substantial reduction in the incidence of HIV amongst gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. In 2011, the Public Health Agency of Canada estimated that about half of all new HIV infections, as well as half of people living with HIV in Canada, are men who have sex with men. Um, the disproportionate burden that's borne by men who have sex with men is even more pointed in some provinces. For example, here in British Columbia, where last year 60% of all new HIV diagnoses were amongst men who have sex with men. So prevention of HIV infection among men who have sex with men in Canada is clearly and should be a priority and a plenary discussion of this topic at CAR is long overdue. So for this reason, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. David Wilson, um, who will be speaking to us about innovative approaches for effective responses to HIV epidemics among men who have sex with men. Um, and while I've just recently gotten to meet David through this conference, certainly his work I've long admired from afar. Dr. Wilson is the Head of Surveillance and Evaluation at Australia's Kirby Institute, formerly known as the National Centre in HIV Epidemiology and Clinical Research at the University of New South Wales, where he develops, coordinates and evaluates Australia's surveillance systems for HIV, viral hepatitis and sexually transmitted infections. David's work can best be described as applied public health research, and he is a leader in the evaluation of HIV epidemics and their drivers in order to inform public health prevention and policy through multiple methods, including empirical evaluation, mathematical modeling, and health economics. Uh, in addition, David's work extends beyond Australia to include projects in Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe, among numerous other countries collaborating with the World Bank, UNAIDS, and Ministries of Health to guide the development and implementation of national HIV strategies. Please join me in welcoming David to the podium this morning. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And I would like to extend my, my thanks to the organizing committee of CAR, and uh, again, particularly to the co-chairs of this track, uh, to Mark and to Anne. It's a pleasure to be here in Vancouver. Uh, here is my conflict of interest slide. Now, this morning I'm going to be speaking about prevention among men who have sex with men. But to put that into broader context, I think I, I thought I would uh, start by thinking about uh, a bit more broader than that, thinking about HIV epidemics globally. Of course, epidemics have different types around the world. Uh, we know that uh, generalized epidemics occur in Southern Africa, but throughout the vast majority of the world, epidemics are concentrated. Now, by concentrated, I mean that uh, the epidemics are focused among the priority populations of men who have sex with men, injecting drug users, or sex workers. And uh, one could define a concentrated epidemic to be one such that if the infections were to be removed from those population groups, and there's no spread there, then uh, the, re the, re the removal of infection from those groups would, not, uh, would be sufficient to, such that the, there, would no, there would not be spread of infection among the general population. But uh, the types of uh, concentrated epidemics do clearly vary across regions of the world. For example, in Southeast Asia, particularly in Thailand and Cambodia and parts of India, most of the epidemics, traditionally, at least in the, f the first wave of the epidemic, has been driven by sex work. Throughout Eastern Europe, uh, epidemics have largely been driven through injecting drug use and also in other parts of Asia. But if we look at North America, Western Europe, and Australasia, the epidemics have largely been driven uh, by men who have sex with men. So if we want to focus on prevention among men who have sex with men, it makes a lot of sense to look at the context of, of the settings in which uh, epidemics have occurred in these population groups. And they've typically been the well-resourced countries, industrialized countries, again, as I say, in, in Western Europe, North America, and uh, Australia and New Zealand. Well, if we look at each of those countries, uh, I'd actually argue that uh, Canada and Australia uh, are probably one of the, one of the most similar comparative, comparative settings. Uh, the epidemics are remarkably similar between Australia and Canada, and so I'm going to put them in parallel uh, to demonstrate some of our points, and then perhaps some of the experiences we've learned in Australia uh, can, be, can, be, uh, uh, can be shared uh, here and uh, may be applied here. So in, in Australia, the, the majority of our infections um, have, have been uh, due to male homosexual contact, 
and uh, similarly in Canada about, about half. Uh, so the, the dominant mode of transmission is male homosexual contact. The main difference between the modes of transmission here um, is, is largely due to injecting drug use. And I think a lot of that is due to uh, the escalation of epidemics among uh, First Nations people here in Canada. Uh, fortunately, we've been able to contain HIV among our Aboriginal populations in Australia. We actually often look to Canada uh, to see what's happening here, and we see this as a big warning sign. We're taking a lot of measures in place in Australia based on what we're seeing here. We're trying to learn lessons from what's happening here in Canada. But one of, the, one of the other main differences actually in the epidemics is, uh, although both, both epidemics are predominantly focused among men who have sex with men, the prevalence is, is uh, a bit different. I, I believe the prevalence of HIV among MSM in Canada is around 18%, 15 to 20%. Um, and uh, in, in Australia, it's about 8 to 12%, so it's a little bit, little bit lower there. I may, I may, be, may be wrong about those figures, but that's, that's my understanding. Uh, these are the epidemic curves, uh, so very similar trends. You can see uh, on the right there the British Columbia rate uh, in, in green and uh, the, the national rate in red there. And uh, you can see compared to Australia, uh, the rates in Australia have been comparable to, to nationally in Canada, perhaps slightly lower, but really uh, very similar in, in their trends. I think Australia has had relatively good success in combating HIV. And I think largely it's been due to luck in the early days. There's a lot of luck, and we'll take it. Uh, I think we need as much luck as we can get uh, in combating HIV. Uh, there were some key people that were involved in, this, in the early stages, and were able to rally the community together. The affected community, particularly the gay community, really rallied together as one, and a partnership was engaged. And I truly believe it is a true, genuine partnership that has been established at the beginning and is carried through to today where the gay community is very actively involved with government, very actively involved with research, very actively involved with clinicians, all working together. Decisions are made uh, in, in, uh, in a very community sense, uh, in, in committees where all people have, uh, have participation. And, and clearly, there's been a lot of input from people infected with HIV. So I think that's actually been, that, that type of structure has actually uh, facilitated the large success that we've had. And it was identified through this partnership that we needed to be proactive and we needed to be pragmatic. Regardless of the laws, regardless of the social, uh, social stigmas that, that might occur, might exist, we needed to be pragmatic. So right in, in uh, the early to mid-1980s, some key actions were taken among these priority populations. Needle and syringe programs were invested heavily, uh, and they're still invested uh, heavily uh, to this day, such that we've never seen an outbreak of HIV among our injecting population. Uh, prevalence is about 1%. Among sex workers, condoms have been universally uh, distributed, um, and there's almost universal uh, condom use uh, with sex workers. Again, it's very, very rare to see any HIV among sex workers. Among MSM, we've not been as successful. We, we clearly have had an epidemic among MSM. Where condoms and testing were promoted heavily, and uh, we believe that that has had uh, an impact in reducing the levels. It would have been much higher uh, had there not been the early engagement at that beginning. And we believe these actions have prevented the chains of transmission that has been observed in many other settings. But it's required strong leadership. It's not only strong leadership of government. Government alone is not sufficient in, in leadership. It's required leadership of civil society of uh, community-based organisations working together uh, with government. And it's been committed to evidence-based response. Of course, this is, uh, ought not to be a political issue, and uh, we've had to engage and uh, educate uh, politicians throughout the process as, as um, the, the politics changes throughout the country. And uh, I, th I think what's underpinned a lot of the Australian response has been commitment to pragmatism, regardless of, of the other barriers. Uh, so as, as I said, uh, based on a, a strong partnership response and that involvement with community has been absolutely key throughout the entire process and continues to this day. So uh, these, are, these are types of campaigns. Campaigns are very common uh, and uh, campaigns have been based on condom distribution and testing, whether it be for HIV or for syphilis or for other types of infections. And uh, regular, regular updates in the campaigns in the gay community have been very common. 
um, and, uh, and they're always always under renewal. But then there's a lot of evaluation that goes around uh, around each of these uh, types of campaigns and trying to adapt to new new responses. So we've got many campaigns, but particularly among condom use and testing among gay men. Sex workers have, uh, have got uh, organisations together. Uh, there's, uh, there are groups of, of sex workers coming together, educating other sex workers. They're very organised uh, and, and very well informed. Sex work was, uh, was illegal in most parts of, of Australia uh, at the beginning of the epidemic. Now it is now decriminalised and illegal in, in most, most areas of the country. This has actually had a large impact uh, being able to, uh, to uh, uh, empower these women, being able to uh, gain greater access uh, to healthcare infrastructure, and it, we have had not we've not seen any adverse impact uh, due to that. Uh, and centrality of people with HIV is absolutely essential here. Uh, policies and programs must be informed and guided by the experiences of people with HIV. Each of these different components have been central in our response to HIV in Australia, and we think that that has been one of the reasons for the success. And then there's the enabling environment. All these structural factors are absolutely key. Prevention is dependent upon sustained, supportive social, legal, and, and policy environments. Uh, as I said before, sex work was, uh, was illegal in most parts of the country at the beginning. And in fact, it, uh, I'm almost embarrassed to, to think that uh, in the early 1980s, homosexuality was, uh, was also illegal uh, in, most, in almost all of Australia. Of course, now it's, uh, it's legalised, and of course, there's now anti-discrimination legislation in each state and territory. But uh, sex work has now been decriminalised, and what we're, what we're finding is because they now have, uh, have uh, they're empowered, they're, they're, it's open, uh, there's good access to healthcare infrastructure, there's almost universal condom use, uh, and what we're finding is that the rates of STIs among sex workers are much lower than what they are in the general population. Uh, as an epidemiologist, I could say that one is much more likely to get infected from a Catholic schoolgirl than one is from a sex worker. <coughs> based, based purely on, on the, the levels of incidence and prevalence, uh, there, there are no infections there. And we, and we think it's largely due to the, uh, the enabling environment and access to health care. Injecting drug use is not legal, uh, but there's high level of investment in needle and syringe programs. Well, in terms of a public health strategic framework, that's what we've been applying in, in Australia to date. Uh, but if we look internationally, uh, UNAIDS has been promoting the know your epidemic and know your response. To at least understand what's going on and what, and what you're doing about it. It's uh, uh, related to surveillance and monitoring programs, understanding your spending. But what we're finding in most parts of the, well, in many parts of the world is, um, realising that HIV prevention is uh, having to do whatever we can. Um, there hasn't been a lot of tools available for prevention uh, throughout a lot of the history. There's the, the realisation that, well, there's a big problem out there, that uh, we must do something. And then trying to gather something together, well, this is something we can do, let's just do it. And it's really not evaluating whether it is the right way forward. We, we need to move the, the UNAIDS, know your epidemic, know your response, to evaluating the response much more rigorously involving impact evaluation. Is what you're implementing working? And that's what I want to address in the next part of, of the presentation. Looking at what is going to work. What, what is going to work for MSM? What's going to work for addressing prevention among other population groups? And then to refine the response based on that evaluation. We need to ensure that what we're, evalu what we're implementing is going to be the most effective response. And of course, there's many different facets of that, from national strategies all the way through to understanding efficiencies and resources and, and sustainable financing. And then, of course, monitoring and evaluating that, that whole process in an iterative manner. So I want to focus on evaluating the response. Does it work? So what should HIV prevention look like? Well, first of all, I think we need to understand exactly where do new infections come from, and then what proven and feasible interventions do we have for each major source of new infection. So what's, what's proven, what's feasible? And then how do we implement and monitor and deliver these interventions? So what proven and feasible interventions do we have? Well, if we look in many parts of the world, uh, you can see vast amounts of money being spent on ineffective programs. Now, my group has just recently conducted a review 
of programs uh, of, across Eastern Europe and Asia where between 30 and 80 percent of funding goes to uh, just general population groups, uh, general population programs or school or workplace programs that have had, have had uh, no impact uh, at all, that has been evident from any impact evaluation, where in each of these settings there's been very concentrated epidemics amongst priority populations. Uh, it's not to say that uh, some of these programs uh, can be useful and are important for, uh, for, for creating knowledge and, uh, and other risk reduction strategies, but it's not the greatest use of resources and there's no you know, evidence of them having impact. So we need to stop implementing ineffective programs and to look at for the portfolio of interventions that have evidence of impact and to realign uh, according to what's, a, what's really occurring in the real world. Now up until about uh, 2010, we actually did not have a lot of strategies available to us, at least in terms of biomedical strategies uh, for prevention. This is a, a summary, uh, summary table provided by Nancy Padian published in AIDS in 2010. It's, it is summarising not all prevention approaches, but those that could be evaluated through randomised control trials. And up to that point, there were 42 RCTs that were conducted, and only eight of those showed any positive impact. So the vast majority of, of prevention strategies that were evaluated through RCTs just did not work. It showed no effect. And of all of those different types of interventions, there's only one that, sh that stood out as actually sh having an impact, and that's male circumcision. The three RCTs uh, showed, uh, showed very similar results, of about a 60% reduction in risk. Uh, and, but that was among heterosexuals. Uh, studies have been conducted, not RCTs, but studies to look at the relative uh, risk reduction uh, due, to, uh, due to circumcision in gay men. As we'd expect, it's not going to have any impact for the receptive partner, but for the insertive partner, it's been shown that it can have potentially some, some impact. But uh, because a relatively small proportion of men uh, practice only insertive sex, it's unlikely to have a large uh, population impact. And of course, the feasibility, the acceptability uh, needs to be highly questioned. So really, circumcision is not a great strategy uh, for intervening among men who have sex with men. So what else do we have for men who have sex with men? Well, of course, we've got condoms. Uh, of course, we cannot evaluate them through an RCT, but we know that condoms are highly effective. So we've got condoms. At least we've got something uh, with MSM. We also have seroadaptive behaviours, uh, negotiated safety, strategic positioning, and serosorting. Uh, this is where, where men uh, engage in different behaviours based on knowledge of, of the, uh, theirs and their partner's serostatus. For example, these are data uh, from uh, gay men in Sydney conducted, uh, this is uh, the data collected about 10 years ago, uh, published in 2010, uh, where we saw that, and actually this was not a strategy that was developed by public health agencies, this was not developed uh, by committees or, or politicians, this was developed, and it was not by researchers, this was developed by people in, uh, on the ground, people in community, coming up with their own strategy. Here uh, we learnt that uh, if somebody knew that their partner was HIV infected, then they were much more likely uh, to take the, uh, take the insertive only role. Here, this is on the right hand side, 56% uh, would take uh, the insertive role only because they know that insertive sex is, uh, is much less risky, about a tenfold reduction in risk compared to receptive uh, unprotected anal intercourse. Whereas if you look on the left hand side, if uh, they believe their partner was HIV negative, then they're much more likely, at least some time, to take the receptive role uh, with, with ejaculation allowed. But of course, this strategy is highly dependent on testing rates, uh, on, on accurate disclosure um, of, of one's serostatus. So it's not, uh, not highly effective, but uh, some epidemiological studies have shown that this strategy is likely to, have, uh, to, likely to, be, uh, to reduce risk. So, the, uh, so in summary, actually, there wasn't a lot available up, uh, to us uh, up until a few years ago uh, for gay men. But of course, there have been substantial scientific advances in HIV prevention in the last three years. They've really been extraordinary. It's not just an evolution. This is a real revolution here. We really have a prevention revolution. I consider this to be the equivalent of the 1996 protease moment when AIDS was transformed into a chronic manageable condition. We've really got a revolution on our hands here, uh, here in prevention. 
And a fundamental change in prevention is perhaps, is perhaps required. Um, but I'm, I'm perhaps uh, preaching to the choir here because this is the, the global heart, uh, the, the hub of treatment as prevention. And of course, it's all, all around uh, antiretrovirals as prevention over the last few years. Uh, I was going to go through the studies of, of, of PrEP, but uh, uh, Dr. Morozo yesterday provided a very elegant uh, presentation of, uh, of all of the studies of, of a PrEP, so I won't go through that this morning. Um, so I'll pass, bypass this, but again, I'll just reiterate some of the points from yesterday that uh, uh, the studies have shown that if one takes the drug, then it's protective. There's a clear correlation across all of the studies that have been conducted, whether it's through, through oral or, or uh, topical gels, uh, PrEP, that uh, the more one takes the drug, the more effective it is. The problem is that it's not acceptable, at least with the frequency of dosing. Uh, people are not using PrEP. And, people, and this is even in a trial setting, let alone uh, outside of a trial setting. So PrEP is unlikely to be a very effective strategy. Also, it's going to be very cost ineffective in, in uh, resource-rich resource, uh, resource -rich countries, such as Canada. Um, I'll bypass intermittent PrEP and focus now on treatment as prevention. Of course, there's the, the large HPTN052 uh, trial. Now, we all, we all know the, the key results of this, but I'll just highlight again that this was among heterosexual couples, heterosexual, well, predominantly heterosexual serotoscordant couples. And uh, here's the main finding that uh, in total, there was a 96% reduction in risk for people who initiated treatment early compared to uh, reduction in transmission compared to those uh, who were not on treatment. It's a huge, huge result, 96% reduction in transmission. This is for hetero heterosexual couples. This is such a major breakthrough that it was the science discovery, science discovery breakthrough of the year um, in 2011 across all fields of science. But treatment as prevention is not really a, actually a new idea. Um, at least as far as I'm aware, it was actually proposed as early as 1991 uh, here in this paper in Nature. So it's not necessarily a new idea, but is it the right idea, the right approach, particularly for men who have sex with men? We know we've got strong evidence for heterosexual couples, uh, particularly in a trial setting, but what I want to do is look at, does it work in the real world? And what are the implications of of applying a treatment as prevention approach and particularly applying just a treatment as prevention approach. So let's look at some observations around the world. First of all, I want to look to, uh, to China because uh, China's implemented, uh, they've had a large uptake of, of treatment, uh, perhaps not a, quite a comparable setting to, to Canada or some of the other uh, settings that are, that are comparable, but there's been, a, there's been a very large study recently published, published last year in The Lancet, where there were almost 40,000 serotoscordant couples, a massive study. This is an observational study, and uh, it was, was community-based, so it was outside of a trial setting. And here they observed not a 96% reduction in incidence, but they observed a 26% 26, 26 reduction in incidence among treated versus non-treated couples. So clearly that's an important result. To reduce incidence by that amount is still very significant. Uh, it saved many infections. But it's not to the same extent as what we've seen in a trial setting. And again, this was just among, uh, among heterosexual couples. What is very important to note, I think, is that they've actually observed no reduction in risk among people who inject drugs. There's no reduction in transmission risk between, uh, yeah, for, for injectors. And I think that has important implications when we look at some of the other observations in other settings. Well, that, so we've got, uh, we've got the, the trial results, we've got some observations for heterosexual couples. What about treatment as prevention in homosexual men? Well, an RCT is no longer possible. We've got very clear results from HPT and 052 that uh, it's just not going to be ethical uh, to, to randomise uh, not, not on treatment among gay men. There are some observational studies being conducted. Um, we'll hear results in a few years. But what about what we're seeing uh, in, in the real world? Now, of course, you're, you are all very well aware of what's occurred here in British Columbia. And the, the massive efforts uh, that have uh, been employed here are completely laudable. It's, it's amazing, amazing progress has been made to increase treatment levels uh, in this province. Um, and uh, so I commend and applaud uh, Julio and all of the, all of the people who have contributed towards that. 
Uh, you're, you're probably, uh, many of you are aware of this paper published in, in The Lancet a couple of years ago showing the very strong ecological association between uptake of treatment and a decline in new diagnoses. But I think we need to look at some of these data bit, quite objectively. Uh, a few points here is, well firstly, you know, there has been a very impressive scale up. Uh, so extraordinary work there. And all of the trends seem to be going in the right direction. However, can, can really that, that decline be attributed to other programs? And I, th I think it probably can be when we look at it. Because when we look at the data, the majority of that decline has been among people who inject drugs. And it's been over the same period of, of treatment scale up that there's been a large scale up of needle and syringe programs, of harm reduction programs. My understanding is also that the drug users have also been shifting away from injecting or to other types, of, types of, of drug use. So there's other reasons for that decline, and the decline appears to be predominantly just among people who inject drugs. Is it due to treatment, is it prevention? Well, it's not clear, it's not obvious to me that it, that it is. If we look among uh, men who have sex with men, my understanding is the data appears to be that uh, the, the levels of diagnosis, the surrogate marker of incidence, has remained relatively stable that uh, the level of HIV infections in this province have been, re been relatively constant, very, relatively consistent over this period. So to me, uh, whether treatment is actually having the large impact among men who have sex with men, it's actually not so, not so clear to me. Uh, but in any case, it's still hi uh, highly, highly commendable that treatment is, uh, treatment is up, uh, being increased to the large scale that it is and that it continue. But is it going to be the prevention? Is it going to have the prevention impact that we hope? Well, I'm not so sure about that. San Francisco is probably the one jurisdiction where perhaps we've actually, we, uh, there is some evidence for treatment having an impact among men who have sex with men. Here we've seen declines in community viral load um, over time, and that's coincided with reductions in incidence. I would highlight, though, that uh, they're starting from a ver relatively high base. The prevalence of HIV is, uh, was about, about 25% in San Francisco among men who have sex with men. So they're starting at a high base. They've got a, they had a long way they could go with regards to their treatment levels. Um, and uh, they, they actually did impose a very aggressive test and treat plan. Uh, I think it's cost them politically uh, because they've forced, forced certain priorities and they've defunded certain areas. Uh, so there's a bit of a community backlash. Um, um, and that may have long, uh, longer term implications. And the, but uh, it's, it, again, it's quite commendable about the stricter evaluation they're applying around their approach. But there is some evidence that treatment is working as prevention, perhaps in San Francisco. What if we look further abroad? I think uh, the UK is, uh, again, a quite a comparable setting uh, to, say, say, Canada. And uh, this is a study just recently published, uh, just uh, last month, in the Lancet Infectious Diseases by Paul Birrell and colleagues. And here, uh, they showed that over a 10-year period, over 2001 to 2010, there was a 3.7-fold expansion of testing. And there's a 2.6-fold increase in numbers on ART. So coverage has increased from about 69% to 80% uptake. So they have certainly been impl implementing test, testing, and they have been implementing treatment to much higher levels. So has treatment worked as prevention? Well, unfortunately not. There has actually been no change in incidence among men who have sex with men in England and Wales. Unfortunately, it's quite a sober message, what we're seeing in other parts of the world. In Australia, we're seeing the same thing. Our levels of diagnosis have been stable or potentially increasing, uh, increasing over the last 10 years. And this has coincided with, with uh, greater, greater levels of, of reduction in community viral load. Community viral load has decreased. You see our levels of, of suppression of virus have increased substantially over the period, over the last 10 years, but we've seen no change uh, or perhaps an increase. We've had a 10 to 15% of our population we believe is, is undiagnosed, at least 70% on ART. We've had increased ART uptake, uh, increased effectiveness, to, uh, where we look at undetectable viral load, but our incidence is not decreasing. Again, a somber message. The same thing is observed in France. The same thing is observed in, in Italy. The same thing is observed in many other parts of the world with MSM-driven epidemics. Unfortunately, it appears to me that treatment as prevention has some limitations um, in homosexual men, just when we look at the, the pure data of what we're seeing uh, in observation. 
I think it has the greatest chance of success in resource-rich countries, such as Canada, with concentrated epidemics, where there is infrastructure in place, there is universal access to good health care. But we're seeing that in many of these settings, there is, uh, the, the markers of incidence have not decreased. Uh, there is a, there's a group called uh, the Annecy Group, which, is, uh, which consists of, of surveillance, national surveillance uh, organisations from uh, many developed countries. And uh, they get together every now and again, and, uh, and uh, they, they last had the meeting in Toronto uh, late last year. And there, uh, we all shared our data for various countries, and we're all finding the same thing. We can, here's a, here's a little, little summary of, of some of the data that's uh, from some of those countries. You can see that in a lot of those countries, we're seeing incidence levels or markers of incidence are stable or increasing, effectively everywhere. And in all of these places, there's been increases in treatment. And uh, testing has not, not decreased, uh, and uh, in many places, it's actually increased. So unfortunately, it's a very somber message across all of these parts of the world that are comparable to Canada, particularly among MSM. We are not seeing the declines in incidence that we might hope. I speculate that maybe we're reaching perhaps a natural equilibrium and it's, it could be difficult to attain levels that, that are much higher than what we're already doing in, in some areas. This is uh, in, in Australia looking at the per capita transmission rate. So the estimated incidence overall the population uh, divided by the, the total estimated number of people living with HIV provides that uh, black curve there. And you can see that it's gone down to, looks like at more equilibrium levels just, just towards the saturation, and where we believe it might be difficult to have a large impact in reducing that even further. And my argument before with San Francisco is perhaps they weren't quite at that, that lower level yet. They had a bit, bit of where they could have gone with the treatment um, and maybe testing to get more towards that level, and it's harder to attain levels that are, that are substantially higher. But with that said, there is always room for some improvement. Uh, there are there improvement in all countries that can be obtained. For example, uh, here, here in Canada, this is the estimated uh, levels of undiagnosed infections among uh, people by various exposure categories, with uh, undiagnosed infections between 20 and 35 percent, depending on the exposure category. Um, and these people are unaware that they have the potential, uh, high potential for transmitting to other people. Um, then th there's still room, obviously, for improvement in increasing testing and uh, initiating these people and antiretrovirals. For prevention to work through treatment, of course, earlier diagnosis is required, and then earlier treatment is required to decrease viral load in the community. Uh, whether PrEP might, might uh, be, a, be a factor that could work as well, I, um, I think it's, well, I, I speculate that it's less likely to be a, be a component of any prevention response among MSM, particularly because of the cost factor and because it's unlikely to be highly used and have high coverage uh, and, and high, high, high adherence among those uh, who, m who may use it. But it may have, a, uh, may have a role, particularly a role among those who are particularly at high risk, such as uh, Ceratus Gordon couples, among them at uh, could potentially have a, a very important role. Uh, so, of course, we need to remove all barriers uh, to HIV testing. And uh, I understand that, that uh, Mark Gilbert is presenting on uh, some of the, the barriers and, and uh, some of the ways to alleviate that uh, among, uh, among populations uh, here in, in uh, British Columbia later this afternoon. Um, Testing, is, need, testing needs to change in, in the way that it's, it is performed. We know that uh, the tests are available, can be ordered over the internet now. Uh, we, uh, this can be shipped from the United States to anywhere in the world, and uh, this will become more common practice over time. But, uh, starting treatment earlier is a key, a key approach, and it is, uh, again, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here. In, in British Columbia, of course, treatment uh, has been occurring much earlier. There are guidelines that are much are moving now towards earlier treatment. The US guidelines are probably the, the most, uh, most aggressive in this way, um, where ART is, uh, should be offered. So it's uh, highly recommended to patients who are at risk of transmitting HIV, uh, so it's effectively to, to all people. WHO guidelines are not quite as aggressive, but still are very much in support of earlier treatment, uh, where those who are in serotis gordon couples, regardless of their CD4 count, are encouraged to be on treatment. The European guidelines uh, for, for treatment um, also, uh, also indicate that people should be offered treatment, effectively regardless of their CD4 count. 
so there is a push for earlier treatment. Treatment as prevention is what uh, the, the buzz is at the moment, and perhaps rightly so. But uh, it, do, it does mean that, uh, well, first of all, we need to think about is it going to have the large impact that we're expecting and what are the longer term implications? But then it also means a shift in our entire prevention approach. Because treatment as prevention happens in the clinical setting. That means that prevention is no longer so much community-based, but prevention belongs in the clinic. So that means that doctors are the gatekeepers for new prevention technologies. So when asked the question, are all, all HIV doctors expert enough in HIV prevention? Particularly when their primary interest is the single person in front of them uh, there in the office. And will doctors recommend treatment as prevention? Of course, education is required. Um, and uh, people living with HIV should be given the option of starting treatment early. But I want us to think through the logical implication of a treatment as prevention only strategy, if all of our efforts are pushed in that direction, or if that's the major focus. Because if we think about it, that, uh, that if, if community starts to realise that they are much less infectious being on treatment, then the logical implication is that condom use is going to decline. We're starting to see that. We're st we saw that in, in France. We're starting to see that a bit in Australia. Condom use is starting to decline. Now, condoms are highly effective. Treatment is prevention. Treatment is also highly, highly uh, effective in prevention. I think they're both probably fairly similar. Uh, condoms are about 95 to 99% effective when properly used. Um, treatment of the same order of magnitude. So effectively, if treatment is being used if, and condoms are, condoms are then uh, are not being used, then you're replacing one technology with another. That's all you're doing, so, you could, uh, so it's, it may, may be unlikely that we're going to see the, the large reductions overall. What we might see is actually lower incremental coverage of prevention, because we certainly have certain levels of coverage of treatment right now, and they're just going to increase. But condom use is actually already very high among uh, gay and other men who have sex with men. We know that's the case uh, here in Canada. It's the same in Australia. It's the same in most other uh, comparable settings. Condom use is already very high. And if there is not the same, same uh, promotion of condom use, and if that, those high levels are not sustained, then all that's going to happen is replacing one prevention technology with another, but, but uh, you're going to have a decline in the condom use. Overall incidence is going to increase, I think, is a logical implication. And I think that could be one of the explanations for what we might be, might be seeing um, in some of these, these countries. And also the fact that treatment may not have the same level of efficacy among uh, gay men and among people who inject drugs, because both of these modes of transmission um, have higher orders of magnitude in their baselines. Uh, in, compared to heterosexual transmission, uh, it's an order of magnitude, about 1% chance of transmission uh, with uh, with a contaminated needle or with, uh, with unprotected anal intercourse, uh, we, uh, compared to about a 0.1% chance for heterosexual sex. Um, maybe there's a difference also in the relative reduction due to treatment. It's unknown. So what proven HIV methods do we have uh, for prevention among MSM? Well, maybe male circumcision for the insertive only men. There's going to be small numbers. It's unlikely to be highly acceptable. So it's not really a viable strategy. We have seroadaptive behaviours. It's uh, not, highly effect not uh, highly protective and highly dependent on testing in partners. We have condoms. Condoms work. They always have worked. Um, and so we've got that. Uh, so we can always, we've always got the condoms. What else do we have? We have PrEP. We've got treatment as prevention. And of course, these must be surrounded by, as I was saying at the beginning, a very good, good uh, structural environment, good enabling environment with strong leadership and good partnership with all people involved. These are absolutely essential in our prevention approach. But effectively, in my view, I think these are our, these are our, our tools that we have available at our disposal for prevention among MSM. If we want highly active HIV prevention, then it must be based on all of those different facets. It needs to have structural, behavioural and biomedical components. Treatment only strategies, and if that's the only thing that's pushed, I think that there could be large danger uh, because uh, it's, it's going to underpin the large, large efforts that have been, uh, that have been gained uh, through, through strong, strong uh, community-based uh, uh, behavioural change um, and good prevention that's taken place for many years. 
uh, but, but with a good enabling environment, good uh, social justice and human rights, with the uh, biomedical strategies available, um, with a behaviour change and with treatment as prevention, I think we've all got uh, as much, much tools as we've got available for, for good, uh, good HIV prevention among gay men. And uh, you know, I think, uh, I think we've, got, we've only got a few tools available. Uh, we are seeing epidemics uh, continuing. Um, and unfortunately, my message is a little bit sober uh, this morning. Um, and uh, it's not, uh, the large push is really for not just treatment only, but we need to continue strongly with the, with the use of condoms because that's what's worked to date. Um, and the fear is we're starting to see declines in, in some parts of the world and that's the danger uh, for, all, for all areas that we need to ensure that they are continue to be promoted. So I'll just finish there and just thank the following people uh, for their assistance in uh, putting this together also. Thank you for your time. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Wilson very much for that uh, talk. I think it's always helpful for us when we uh, look outside our own borders and see what the evidence is in, in other settings, and you've done a, uh, a very reasoned uh, overview of, of that data. Uh, so I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your, your presentation today. Did not disappoint, and uh, Mark and I were uh, so delighted to have you come. Um, and like Dr. Hunter, I would like to point out that Dr. Wilson is a very approachable man, and I encourage you to come and talk to him. And I, I know he would be delighted to speak with you about uh, all the work he's doing, not just in Australia, but in many other parts of the world. So thank you very much, and uh, merci à tout le monde, and a uh, bonne conférence.